The need to unite Europe grew understandably out of the devastation left behind after two catastrophic world wars. Of all the empires, it was perhaps the Nazis who came closest to pulling off the military conquest and occupation of Europe in recent times. In June 1940, Hermann Göring, Reich Marshal of the German Luftwaffe, reviews final plans for Operation Sea Lion, the German invasion of Great Britain. He also discusses with Hitler a new plan to unite Europe, not just under the conquering hammer of Blitzkrieg, but through a lasting political and economic union, which the Nazis named Europäische Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft, or the European Economic Community. In 1942, a conference is held in Berlin to discuss this political and economic integration of Europe. Of all the nations targeted, Britain has proved the wild card because she alone has successfully resisted invasion. Rising to his feet at the conference, Nazi economist Professor Horst Jecht of Berlin University firmly declares that Britain is the greatest obstacle to Germany fulfilling her historic aim of dominating Europe. Winston Churchill also believed Britain had an incompatible destiny with that of the continent. Referring to the United Kingdom's reliance on her overseas trade, Churchill stated, if Britain must choose between Europe and the open sea, we will choose the sea. Both Churchill and Yecht were independently remarking on the same phenomenon Napoleon had noticed 150 years before. The Great Britain was a global trading power, and the nations of Europe weren't. According to the Nazis, Great Britain's awesome maritime capability was beggaring Europe because it was drawing trade away from the continent. If Britain could be conquered militarily or economically, broken up once and for all as a significant economic and political entity, the spoils of all her trade and wealth would go to whoever ran the new European empire. Few in Berlin were in any doubt about who would do the running. But the tide of war turned against Germany. In 1944, a meeting was held at the Hotel Rotus House in Strasbourg between officials of the Nazi government and German industrialists. The theme of the meeting was, how will Germany dominate the peace when she loses the war? Following the end of World War II, the rebuilding of Europe, and Germany in particular, became a pressing necessity and was largely funded under the Marshall Plan by the United States. Both Washington and London saw the rapid stabilization of the continent after the war as essential in order to prevent any incursion into Western Europe by the new enemy to be feared, the Soviet Union. Winston Churchill agreed that some form of Commonwealth of Nations in Europe was desirable for establishing stability and a lasting peace. But he never envisioned Britain as being part of any future United States of Europe. Winston Churchill's view of Great Britain's relationship with Europe after the Second World War is summarized with these words of his. But we have our own dream and our own task. We are with Europe, but not of it. We are linked but not comprised. We are interested and associated but not absorbed. The European Union officially began life as the European Coal and Steel Community in 1951. A modest industrial cooperation between France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Luxembourg and Holland. Six years later in 1957, the Treaty of Rome was signed by the six participating coal and steel community nations. Declaring its goal as the ever closer union of the peoples of Europe, the Treaty of Rome went far beyond launching just a common market. It established the fledgling apparatus for an idealistic new superpower. This new entity was given an existing and unsettlingly familiar name, the European Economic community. In 1963, Charles de Gaulle and Conrad Adenauer signed the Treaty of Elysee, 
signifying the symbolic burying of the hatchet between France and Germany. This was the start of a dynamic new dual leadership role in Europe for the two countries. De Gaulle later resigned and within a year was dead. Britain was invited to submit yet another application to join the EEC. This time, Edward Heath, now as Britain's Conservative Prime Minister, signed the Treaty of Rome and took Britain into the common market on New Year's Day, 1973. Responding to deep concerns within his own country that joining the EEC would compromise Britain's national sovereignty and independence, Heath sought to reassure the British people in a government white paper. He wrote, There is no question of Britain losing essential national sovereignty. The master plan, of course, was well known to Edward Heath, Lord Hailsham and their colleagues in Brussels. It was the eventual creation of a new European superstate out of 25 existing nations in Europe and Scandinavia, and Britain was going to be part of it. From 1973 onwards, the slow but consistent transfer of power from Westminster to Brussels through successive treaties our own politicians signed became known as the Acquis Communautaire. It was nicknamed the Ratchet, for once powers had been given to Brussels by the member state, they could never be returned. Initially I thought, like everybody else, that uh, we had joined a common market and what could be nicer and more friendly and sensible and economically wise to do. But since then, in 1975, when we had the vote to remain in that, so we were told, um, it's become one or two things further than just a common market. It then became, a few years later, a European economic community, then a European community. It's now the European Union with all sorts of controls and restrictions, regulations, and we're fast approaching via this new constitution, something that the French have already named potentially a United States of Europe. And I'm not at all sure that that's what I and many others voted to join back in 1975. This is the Strasbourg Parliament. It was built in 1999 at a cost of £300 million. It is open for only four days every month. What happens at the end of that four days is we load our offices into tin boxes and then lorries arrive downstairs and drive the whole lot nearly 300 miles up to Brussels where the boxes are unpacked for the next three weeks when we're supposed to be there and then it's all brought back again. This whole process of shifting the administration and the staff from one home to another is costing the European taxpayer over 100 million euros a year. It is the biggest scam in human history. We're not talking about billions of pounds, we're talking about trillions of pounds. Why a country which has been independent for 900 or more years would ever wish to involve itself in such political chicanery and nonsense as something which defies anyone who is sane. And only now have we got just about 14 or 15 months before they rivet on us a pan-European constitution which would be superior to our own splendid constitution, one which is the pride of the world and pioneered the way for sensible living. And here we are giving it all away. In black and white, the draft constitution wording confirms Brussels will exercise competence and primacy over member states' own laws. For the British, this will mean being stripped of any remaining independence, losing control over our foreign policy and armed forces, the handing over of our legal system and law enforcement to the European Union, the scrapping of the pound sterling to be replaced by the euro, the handing over of our remaining currency and gold reserves to the European Central Bank, and the total regulation of British domestic and international trade by the European Union. Coincidentally or otherwise, the European goal of dominating Britain, unfinished business going back centuries, will have been accomplished.